before we get started, does anybody have any um, general comments or, um, or additions as we start? I just have one, you know, in reading the varieties of Christianity, you know, the, the, and the Christian mysticism, um, there's, there's so much variation that I almost don't understand what it is anymore. <laughs> Uh, it, it's you know you, you we refer to it as a, one of the great religions, but it's it kind of encompasses everything and and uh, I just I just wasn't aware that there was that much variation in the in the different uh, views of it, different ways it's evolved over time. It was uh, Robert really put together at least for me a pretty comprehensive overview, and it was. Uh, just a little eye-opening. Now, maybe all the great religions are similar, but Christianity seemed to be a lot more, have a lot more um, components to it. That's all. Yeah, that, yeah that's I found the, the same. Uh, Michelle is trying to get a person from the Russian Orthodox Church to talk about the Philokalia. And um, uh, that that book is like very Eastern. It, it sounds like yoga. Uh, so, and that's part of Christianity too. So yes, there are, we in the West, we normally know the different denominations that are more or less the same, but with little differences. But if you start seeing all, all the, the branches of Christianity that are out there, it's really, as you say, very universal. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Michelle, did you find someone from the Russian Orthodox Church already? Um, actually, no. Well, what I did was uh, St. Barbara's in Santa Paula. It's a little um, a monastery. nunnery, yeah, monastery, yeah. monastery. And they are actually um, part of that uh, Orthodox religion, but they couldn't speak. So they said they would put us in touch with somebody who, um, who knows the Philokalia and that might be um, interested. Do you know somebody? Well, I might, I could ask him. Okay, that'd be great. For when? Uh, we, it have, what we'd have to do now is it'd have to be an adjunct um, uh, class, an, additional, an yeah. additional one. So we're thinking maybe a Thursday night and then we could put it up on, on YouTube. Okay, let me ask him. He's super busy, but I'll ask. Okay. 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 So um, as we start here, uh, it starts with um, the Roman Empire and their subject subjugation under um, under governors like Pontius Pilate. So that's kind of where um, Robert starts here. Uh, the second paragraph talks about the different um, factions, I don't know if you would call that, uh, where the zealots were more of a resistance, the spiritual renewal, this was John the Baptist where he wanted to really just kind of dive um, back into the teachings. Um, it says here, John the baptizer <coughs> declared that God was about to judge the world and punish the wicked. He offered a symbolic washing away of sin through immersion in the water to those who repented. Uh, then we have the Pharisees. The Pharisees advocated strict following of the law as the path to religious purity. Um, the hope was that God pleased was pleased with his people's new but sincere piety, would hear their cries for freedom. And then uh, some of the Jewish elite associated with the temple in Jerusalem believed that discreet collaboration with Rome was in the best interest of the defeated nation. So I think those that's a common, like common uh, sex or common factions in any time of strife. Yeah, so that, that was like the Jewish environment in which Jesus uh, operated. We see in the Gospels, he mentions many times the Pharisee and right. the people in the temple, etc. Okay, so then, um, then they talk about um, in the background that the ap apocalyptic teaching uh, from the Greek, 
Greek meaning disclosure or revelation offers secret knowledge of dramatic events to come as a result of direct divine inter intervention. Uh, predicted a time of unprecedented troubles followed by sudden decisive action by God to defeat evil and establish righteousness, especially rife in periods of great anxiety and among subjugated peoples. Uh, Blavatsky said that the Apocalypse or uh, the book of Revelation is actually a Kabbalistic book that, that was added to the Gospels. Okay. Okay, so then um, uh, they had the faith that uh, God in his own all-powerful way would soon drive out the oppressor and reestablish the Jewish kingdom, God's kingdom. Um, this would be done, they said, through an agency of a Messiah who would easily disperse the foe. Um, Messiah means anointed one, and in Greek, Christos is what means anointed one. All right. And so, yes, please jump in with any comments. I have one. Okay, go ahead. Yes, Jim. Oh, Robert didn't mention the Sumerians. The Sumerians were a sect of Jews who did not recognize the temple at Jerusalem, but had their own rabbi and they worshiped on a mountain uh, not too far away. And, and there's uh, a gospel story where Jesus said, neither here nor on the mountain, uh, where you find the son of God or something like that. Anyway, he, he was referring to that. So just, just yeah, Interesting. thanks. Yeah. And yeah, and that was the same time frame that we're talking about. Um, Robert, oh, yeah. yeah, says 30 CE. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there, there were the Essenes also who were these yeah. Jewish mystics that uh, there is the idea that Jesus was trained by them. Now, HPV puts the birth of Jesus a hundred years before what we think, 102, I think, or something like that. Yeah. So when, when we look at all these groups, there may be some that were earlier than we think, but they were still part of the environment of Jesus. And if I remember correctly, James Lefevre does a good job covering those different sects um, in, in and around those times in that video that I showed. And aren't there, aren't there those who think that John the Baptist was 500 years different from Jesus? Or that Jesus was even a myth? Mm. Yeah, I never heard uh, about anything for that matter about John the Baptist, the chronology. Uh, but there were some followers of him that yeah, that they did. They thought that Jesus w was not a real person. That he was more like a spiritual principle. So for them, John the Baptist was the Messiah in a sense. Also, HPV says that there is in Greek there are these two words, Christos and Christos, yes. and that they have to do with the disciple before initiation and the disciple after initiation, something like that. So um, around 30 CE, John, uh, the baptizer, baptized Jesus. Uh, soon after that, he was arrested and executed. Um, so this inspired John to gather disciples and start a ministry, uh, according to, to this here. Um, and then down here, the essence the essence is to practice forbearing love and non-resistance of evil because God will shortly by dealing with it in judgment and to be perfect even as God who is to rule is perfect. By comparison, John's moral message was one merely of repentance and following justice. Um, so uh, unlike John, um, Jesus did not baptize, although his followers did. His works of healing were a major sign in his ministry of the power of the coming kingdom, just as bad baptism had been John's major sign. So that uh, Robert shows the difference there between what John did and what Jesus did. Well, there's also a statement in the Bible that uh, 
Jesus's baptism is with fire, not with water. Okay. And, and, and does it say that, that that is his only baptism or, you know what I'm saying? Like was the original one with John with water and then uh, another, the his spiritual one, right? His spiritual yeah. one was by fire. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't say explicitly, so we have to read into it. Okay. These um, last, these last two paragraphs on this page, um, talks of, uh, basically about um, uh, la 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 la. Sorry, Jesus taught everywhere, not just in a synagogue or at a certain place. So um, he taught everywhere, and then he brought his message to everyone. That was a basic tension in early Christianity. The idea was Jesus a Jewish reformer, and he was you know, just without, within Judaism, or was Jesus bringing a new gospel, a new message, and this was to be a new religion uh, aside from Judaism? So some apostles thought one way and some thought the other. Okay, uh, so one of his messages was a sympathetic awareness of the ways and problems of ordinary life with its sorrows, joys, and innocent festivities. Um, Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday is, is named, um, he made certain dramatic gestures. He entered the pilgrim thronged holy city in a sort of procession. And this is what came to be commemorated as Palm Sunday. He caused a disturbance by overturning the tables of currency exchangers and chairs of the sellers of birds and animal for sacrifice in the temple courtyard. Um, so then um, the Roman elite perceived uh, his revolutionary political overtones um, as not good. Before the week, before the end of the week, the decision had been to, taken and carried out to dispose of him. Jesus was arrested with the help of Judas. Um, okay, that's it. So then the early Jesus move, movement. Um, the tragic death of one so young, beloved and appealing to many inevitably worked deeply in the minds of those who had been committed to his movement and caught up in his vision of the kingdom. They tried to find ways to understand the man and invent in categories familiar to them. Some mindful of the tradition of a coming Messiah can join the image with a uh, poignant Passages in Isaiah about the suffering servant, the hero who saves his people, not by military victory, but by undergoing extreme torture, bearing his back to the smith smiters, his check cheek to those who plucked out the hairs. So the, to me, this um, kind of talks about or explains the um, how we get the stories behind Jesus or the myths behind Jesus that they, they, they took the stories in the Old Testament as prophecies? Because the, the, the Jews were under the dominion of the Romans. So some of them were expecting a political savior that would take them out of slavery and lead them to the promised land. So the Romans were aware of that. And some people were regarding Jesus as being a political player there. So that's what the Romans were worried about. Okay. Then uh, Robert gives us some words on son of man in connection um, with Jesus, a term that was used for Greek kings and deities alike, or even of philosophical concepts like logos, word or principle or Sophia, wisdom, describing the creative power of God at work in the world. Um, okay, so uh, soon enough, he had become a supreme symbol of the ineffable mysteries of life, death, and God, all of which he somehow seemed to bring into focus. His form and the instrument of his suffering were reproduced in gold, silver, and gems around the world. 
Um, this is where the title of Lord came from. Uh, Christianity has never been a purely individual religion. It was communal even before the crucifixion. Um, okay, up here. On the Friday that Jesus died on the cross, the community was dispirited and scattered, but on the first day of the next week, word of the new event brought the community together again. It was reported by Mary Magdalene, a woman close to Jesus and the disciples that by Peter himself that the tomb was empty and Jesus was walking in the garden. And then it just talks about the people that he met. Um, and then that some of the apostles uh, received the Holy Spirit. After receiving the Holy Spirit, they preached basically that Jesus who had died had risen from the dead that his event confirmed that he was and is both Lord and Messiah, the Christ, and that all the scriptural prophecies about both the Jewish and universal roles of the Messiah and the last days were filled or would be in him. There's an interesting parallel here with the Egyptian mysteries and how the candidate was uh, kept in the pyramid for three days and then later brought out and placed in the sun. But uh, it's certainly a parallel story. Right, that's what I, I got from, from this part is that it wasn't necessarily they were telling stories of Jesus, but relating stories that had been told to the things that he had done. HPV talks about like the a school of mysteries to Jesus and that many of the, the stories that we, we think were part of his life were really uh, spiritual myths, like what Jim is saying, and they were solar myths and, and that they were not necessarily things that happened during Jesus's life. I don't know how that would work with the community who knew Jesus, except that if Jesus lived a hundred years, because we normally think that the gospels were written within the first, what, 30, 60 years. So if that was the case, people were still alive who knew Jesus. But if Jesus had, was born a hundred years earlier, right. then it's easier to make of his life more of a myth. What do you mean by solar myth? Well, the idea like the logos, uh, the, the, um, Jesus represents the logos of our, of our personality. And uh, normally all these myths where the hero is, represents the spiritual spark uh, is called the solar myth. And many times the sun is connected to that myth because the sun it's also like the body of the logos or a representative of the logos. So that's how they are called. I, I don't know much about mythology. Uh, maybe somebody else knows more. Okay. All right. And the last part here is about Paul and uh, HPB uh, and many other classic theosophical writers have regarded both Jesus and Paul as initiates. Um, he uh, was a Hebrew who was a Roman citizen. Paul. Paul, yeah. Uh, he experienced a vision of Jesus the Christ appearing to him saying, Paul, Paul, why do you persecute me? Or Saul, Saul, because his name was Saul. Um, Paul was a great, it was a great if controversial advocate of the new faith between 45 and 62 CE and Christianity's first theologian. Uh, he, uh, he, was, um, he was the one that brought um, non-Jews, if I remember mm -hmm. correctly, into Christianity. Uh, um, uh, HPV says in one place that the true founder of Christianity was Paul, because before him, Christianity was still part of Judaism. He's the one that said, no, this is a different religion for everybody, not only for Jews. And he, he started spreading it around. Right, uh, they say here, uh, more and more he saw himself as the apostle to the Gentiles. 
um, non-Jews. And his calling was to show that in these days after Jesus, the Gentiles had been grafted into Israel as an alien branch onto an old tree. They had only to believe that believe the gospel or good news about Jesus and have trust in him and they would be brought into oneness with God, not on their own merits, but as a free gift of God transmitted even as they were grafted into old Israel through Jesus Christ. Jesus' death on the cross, Paul said, broke the sway of sin and death in the world. Oh, I'm sorry. It's this last paragraph here. Um, and his rising again brought new life by joining oneself to Christ by faith, not just belief, but commitment of one's whole self. And by the acceptance of baptism, the, ri the ritual immersion in water representing initiatory rebirth, one received new life in Christ and was no longer of this world, which is passing away, but had entered into the everlasting reign of God. Okay. Um, let me, yeah. yeah, sorry that I'm speaking no, too please. much. I, I am. Speaking. This is all part, it's quite interesting how Christianity came to be what it is. Because if you were a Jew, you were a Jew because you were born a Jew. And and because of that, you had a special covenant with God. So when St. Paul started spreading this to non-Jews, the question was, okay, how do you come into this covenant with God? So he devised this idea that by having faith, by believing in Jesus, um, that was enough. You were made righteous. And you, you were made like a Jew by having faith in, in Jesus and by being baptized. So that's how the conversion would happen now. Okay, any other comments? Okay, so this first paragraph at the end in um, this next chapter says, uh, um, ho uh, however diverse these manifestations were, um, uh, Robert says that some 2 billion of the world's 7 billion souls are at least nominally Christian. Um, the one central focus, the man Jesus Christ, who died on the cross some 2,000 years ago. They all affirm in their own way that this is the central event in human history and that power released through it can and must be appropriated now for our healing and wholeness in this life and in the life to come. Christian worship both teaches and enacts this appropriation. So that's the beginning of, of this chapter. Now the next few pages were uh, just about the different factions isn't the right word. What do I say? Yeah, six. Sex, okay. Um, uh, here that, that he lived. So he starts with e Eastern Orthodox. He goes into Roman Catholic. Um, he talks a little bit about the liberal Catholic Church, which we'll hear next week. Um, then he talks about the Reformation, the Lutheran and the Calvinistic Reformations, uh, the Radical Reformation, Reformation, the Mennonites and the Quakers to the Baptists and the Methodists. Um, and if anybody read anything here and has any comment, please speak up. Um, so he goes on um, with more uh, than down here. He talks about the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, the Lutherans in Scandinavia and parts of Germany, the Calvinists in Scotland and the Netherlands, and the Anglicans in England. Anglicans. Anglicans. I always say that. Anglicans. Okay. Um, okay, then. Yeah, so we said to skip this part uh, at the beginning of the meeting so that we can focus on the mysticism. So here we go about Christian mysticism and devotion. Um, does anyone want to read or how do you want to do that? How do you want to go from here? I can read. Thank you. Um, the two paragraphs that are on the screen at the moment? Yep. Okay. Yep. All right. Christian mysticism and devotion. Perhaps more than other religions, 
Christianity makes a clear cut distinction between theological writing and mystical devotional literature. Christian doctrine and thought have an objective and historical quality that makes it possible to understand them, at least superficially, without direct experience of the divine realities that lie behind them. Many would say that they can have saving faith without the sort of experience of God of which mystics and devotees speak. In this respect, Christianity shows its difference from a religion like Buddhism, in which the equivalent of salvation would have to be the ultimate transformation of consciousness represented by nirvana. But mainstream Christian theology and preaching is generally more concerned with the personal decision for salvation than with a mystical experience to, to which not every Christian is called. By mystical experience, we mean experience interpreted as immediate contact with the divine, very frequently expressed in the language of unity. I felt the oneness of all things, or I was united with God. Mystical writings describe this experience and how, it, how to attain it. In contrast, devotional writing presents prayers and meditations addressed to God or in in intended to lead one's mind towards union with God. Since the one who prays or meditates is still speaking to or thinking about God, a certain distance, however, however filled with love and feeling, remains between the person and the divine. Devotion, on the other hand, can fall short of the mystic's experience of sheer union. That is why mystical experience is often said to be beyond words. And mystics may shock the conventional pious when they say that even prayer and meditation are practices to be surpassed. Okay, any uh, comments or discussions, questions? This was a, a tension that was there from the very beginning because you had like the regu what now is regular Christianity, the Christianity of Paul, which required faith and devotion and belief. And then you had the Gnostics, which required an inner experience. And for a while they, they lived together, um, but eventually when the, when the Roman empire was falling and they wanted a unifying faith and they took Christianity, I guess it was far easier to unify people, unify them around the belief than, than promoting these difficult to attain experiences. Well, that I think you could say the same about theosophy. There are those that, that study or any, I think any religion that has um, an exoteric and an esoteric. It's, it's harder to explain what to do esoterically. It's kind of something that you just have to like study and build up, I don't know, I think like inertia and then it comes to you in a certain way, of, you know, at least in mysticism. Mm -hmm. okay. You could also say that all the spiritual traditions of mankind have this, like you were saying, this kind of tradition of mysticism attached to it. No matter what tradition it is, there's always those individuals that have seemed to have had these unusual experiences that are ecstatic in nature. And it seems like within those mystical traditions, and I think this is drawn out, you know, in detail in the secret doctrine, um, we see the traces of a common doctrine. We see the traces of a common experiences that, you know, lead one to see some evidence to the fact that there's a parent doctrine, which is where, you know, theosophy is pointing. Thanks. Okay. I did the, um, the, the second paragraph Jerry read really, I mean, it puts the two at almost at odds with each other, but it just, 
it's so common throughout the various religions just seems that it's the next natural step, you know, in, in uh, evolution. Uh, Maria? Yeah, thank you, Doug. Um, one thing that I, I think is, um, is interesting about the Christian faith, at least today, even in even the evangelical or fundamentalist movements, is that there's just this huge emphasis on um, evangelism through, through service. And I was struck here by the statement that um, they believe that faith, faith in, in God is enough and have no need of any any I think about my brother-in-law, not particularly interested in any talk or even thinking about things like transformation or consciousness raising or anything like that. The, the, the emphasis in, in many of them is really ministering in, in Jesus's name to others, whether it's food kitchens or alcohol anonymous or whatever, so many movements, service movements have arisen within the Christian faith, um, no matter what the sects have, uh, have to be. And um, it seems as though, you know, accepting Jesus as your Lord and savior is, is enough. And we don't know what that means for most people, but it appears in that tradition to have something to do with giving to one's neighbors to, to really, alleviating suffering. I don't think most mystics are so service oriented. Mm -hmm. The sacrifice is more esoteric. It's more um, uh, losing, losing oneself in the, or being immersed in the experience of, of, the, of, the, of, of God, however they imagine it. But but I think I, I, I would venture to say that most of the great service organizations today that are, are really ministering to the suffering in their own way, very few of them would consider themselves mystics. The mystic doesn't seem to be called so much to that. I, anyway, that's just my thought. It's interesting, uh, the, uh, the, the dictum of Christ was to love the Lord your God with, with all your mind, all your heart, you know, all your being, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Well, most people think to love your neighbor as yourself uh, is means as much as you love yourself to love them. But but a deeper understanding of it is that the neighbor is yourself, and that's a much more mystical understanding of that statement. Our neighbor is ourself. Um, I found something in, in the uh, glossary today that I'd never seen before about baptism, which I'd like to share with you all. Uh, this is a definition of the word bodhasp, which she says is Chaldean. An alleged Chaldean, but an esoteric teaching, a Buddhist or a bodhisattva from the East was the founder of an esoteric school of neo sabianism which are the, the uh, star, star worshipers of South Arabia, I believe, and whose name, or no, and whose secret rite of baptism passed bodily into the Christian rite of the same name. So baptism wasn't originated with John the Baptist uh, by any means, but came through a bodhisattva, it says, from the East. Does she give the date? No, but the neo sabianisms were around the time of Jesus, okay. around, or, or, and somewhat before, I think, also. Um, oh, I was gonna say something there. Oh, the Jews also have a right called uh, they have a, a sacred bath called the mikvah, uh, and they uh, women use it obviously after the after the menstruation period, a week afterward. But uh, but also men can use it 
And it's also used whenever someone is going to undertake some new endeavor, a marriage, uh, a new business, uh, things like that. It's a kind of purif purification. And it's still used today. There's a mikvah in Santa Barbara. And for conversions too. Okay, thanks, Ad thanks Adele. Okay, does anybody want to read the next two paragraphs about Dionysius? I can read. Thank you. The first Christian mysticism after the New Testament was deeply indebted to the terminological, terminology, excuse me, and philosophical concepts of Neoplatonic philosophy. The most influential Christian mystical writings of this sort or those of the writer who called himself Dionysus, the Areopagite, now sometimes called Pseudo-Dionysus, and believed to be a Syrian monk of the sixth century. Dionysus was a Neoplatonist who believed that God in total fullness and infinity is beyond human knowledge, and so is ultimately nameless and inefficable. Nothing we could say about the deity is adequate to the unbounded mystery of divine being. Dionysus thus speaks of God as a darkness which is beyond light. Though the darkness is really due to an excess of light beyond that which human faculties can handle. Like the shadows that fall across the eyes when we try to look directly at the sun. The way to God is through an unknowing by which human intellect and feelings, too frail for this most sublime task, are stilled in mystical contemplation. We pray, Dionysus says, that we may come unto this darkness, which is beyond light, and through the loss of sight and knowledge, may see and know that which is vision and knowledge. This Dionysic Neoplatonist approach was very influential in the Christian mysticism of the Middle Ages and the Reformation. Thank you. Reminds me of the voice of the silence. Or the cloud of unknowing. Yeah. Yeah, the cloud of unknowing, it is said, was directly influenced by Dionysius or pseudo, I mean, the, at, at first they thought that he was a disciple of Paul called Dionysius. Then scholars now say that this monk lived later, so they call him pseudo Dionysius. But traditionally, most mystics thought that Dionysius was a disciple of St. Paul. Okay. Um... Then uh, uh, we go on, but during the same Middle Ages, something else began stirring as well. A Christian mysticism of the affirmation of images was coming to flower. If mysticism of the Neoplatonist Dionysic type says to take away all that is not God and so often is called the negative way. Its counterpart is the affirming way of using images in the mind and before the eyes as stepping stones to God. One example of an affirmative mystic was the beloved St. Francis of Assisi. So one is like the neti neti. Yeah, go ahead. No, 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 I was just gonna say that. Yeah, just uh, one is like, the because God is beyond creation and all we know is creation, no image that we can make uh, can, can apply to God. So the only way to get to God is to let go of all images. So that would be Dionysius. Uh, but the other is you can know something about God by his creation. So that would be more like affirmations. Francis. Yeah, the images and affirmations or 
the like the beauty of creation, the order in creation, the love, these are all like reflections of God. So by contemplating that, you can get to something about God. Right. And, and that's what uh, the affirmative. Right. The yeah. next paragraph says Francis fervently promoted adoration of Jesus in the manger and on the cross, both affirmative pictures to which devotion could be affixed in mind and heart. Traditional credits the little poor man of Assisi with making the first Christmas uh, crush and with receiving the stigmata, marks of the nails and crowns of thorns and wounded side of Christ on the cross in his own flesh. The Franciscan order which burgeoned in the late Middle Ages, eagerly carried his style of devotionalism through Western Europe and later to the Spanish and Portuguese New World. So just to finish up on that. Yeah, yeah in so, Argentina, we had uh, like the Franciscan nuns or Franciscan priests are quite famous. So in the, in the previous paragraph, and right in the middle, you know, talking about this neti neti idea, this negative way. It's just um, to take away all that is not God. What do you think they meant by that? What is not God? If God is the creator, what is it that God is separate from in, in the mind of the Christian theologian? Well, I would say that everything is separate. In traditional Christianity, God is not in nature. God is beyond nature. So uh, God and creation are separate. So the way to get to God there is to discard everything that is part of creation, therefore it's not part of God. Um, so is that the asceticism? So taking away... Yeah, yeah, that also. I mean, part of it. And yeah. in like in meditation or in prayer, that's why Dionysius says... You know, you, you can't give a name to God. You cannot say that God is good. You cannot say that God is loving because all those are part of creation. So it's like getting to the, the emptiness. Um, so in Christianity, they don't have that sense that God is everywhere in general. Is, is that similar to uh, Nis Arbidaka's I am that? Yeah. I, I, I kind of remember that from uh, my catholic indoctrination so you're you're quite right about that it's it just it strikes me as strangely contradictory because god creates this beautiful universe but it's not god so to get closer to god you need to take away all the things that god made uh, there's just an enormous contradiction in this that doesn't yeah. add up to me. Yeah. Well, the way that it, there is, and the Gnostics were aware of that, and the way that they solved that is by saying that the real God didn't create the universe, that this creation is the result of a lower God, uh, Yaldabaoth, which is a materialistic God, and we have to get rid of the world and go beyond the world. Uh, because this was just a mistake. So Christianity has that tendency or had in, in the past uh, with the, the Protestants embraced creation far more than the Catholics did. And, and sometimes with a quite materialistic approach, but the early Christianity was very world denying, perhaps influenced by Neoplatonism and all that. Krishna had an solution to this dilemma. He said, even though I've created the entire universe, I remain a part of whole. So he's, he's made the universe, he's in the universe, but that's, that's not all of him. He's, he's outside of it as well. And uh, it's whole and, and intact. And in the Christian mass, we, we symbolize that sort of by the way we, we, we break the, the priest host in half over the chalice. And we break a little piece off and put it into the chalice, but the major, piece, the two larger pieces, we reassemble them on the on the paten. So uh, that symbolism is there in the Eucharist as well. You know, you know, there's two rather profound ironies in all of this. 
first one is that the idea that there was a superior God that's responsible, f- that, that, that's not responsible for the creation of the universe, that, that's precisely the trap apparently that the Jewish tradition fell into by assuming that a lesser God, Jehovah, was the supreme God. And so it's ironic that, you know, they would make that statement that um, there's this gap between the real God and the creator of the universe when they themselves, according to secret doctrine, at least, had um, elevated a lesser God to to a higher status. The other irony, which is even more pertinent to us today, is that this horrible disconnection between the divine and nature that led to this view of of nature as being kind of the enemy of this spiritual aspirant has led us to the conditions we find ourselves in today, where we've had such a disregard for nature for so long, particularly in the Western world, that we're struggling with pandemics, climate change, you know, levels of pollution never seen in, in recorded history. So some of these ideas are come come back to roost in kind of a dramatic way. I think there's also been an inordinate um, emphasis in the Abrahamic faiths on the place of priests and men, Father God. And um, Mother Nature then has been lost. The Divine Mother has been elevated in some faiths, but she's secondary to the Father. Interestingly enough, she's the mediator between heaven and earth. Uh, HPV says what you are saying that the Holy Ghost uh, is feminine. Uh, The paraclete, uh, it's a Greek word that is feminine. And that at the beginning, the Holy Ghost was like the feminine divine, which was an intermediary, but then you know, that was uh, changed, uh, that was eliminated. You know, another irony too is Francis of Assisi is that one saint, one of the most prominent saints in the Christian tradition that embraced the beloved of nature. He's, you know, um, the patron saint of uh, the natural world in the Christian tradition. Pablo Maniti. Thank you. I would like to say a few things. Uh, first, I born in a small town in Italy, in Calabria, in the south of the Italy. Very poor place after the war. And the town has three church and one school. My mother which she never read any anything in her life, but she knows by memory all this uh, liturgy and things from the church. And she was very influential on myself, on me to believe. She has a faith, but no, any of this deep philosophy, interpretation of the Bible, uh, she, she doesn't know how many Gospels were in the Bible. She don't even know uh, all these uh, treatise, philosophy, and the, the only thing it was her faith and her belief and do the, the good, treat everybody with respect, with love. Now, the other thing I want to say is um, many books were written about the church, about the New Testament, about what they found 
how much information they release from the uh, uh, material they found in, in a cave. Uh, many also movies were made. I remember I visited so many churches when I was very young, just to, to watch the movies they show in Christmas. So the, if we see uh, what is happening in the context of uh, religion is the emotional move, move, emotion. We believe because we think we can be safe. The church say to you, you believe you're going to be safe. You believe and you donate money to the church, you go fast to heaven. So all these things we talk about are important in the because we know history. And if we know history, we know better uh, to be able to uh, be more responsible, uh, be better person. And fundamentally the church was created to uh, help help the community, but then degenerate and become other things. I was involved before in, in the church because I went to the church and I read every Sunday. And I was part of the congregation and I attended to one, one session about business. And I, I don't know. This happened in New York. And one priest, he complained to the, uh, uh, what the, what do you call the Monsignor in charge of the um, church. He said, Monsignor, I cannot be a priest anymore. Uh, why? Because is not enough money, I cannot live. <laughs> so you see, the, this, uh, then the, the Monsignor say in another part of that, he say, this year we are short two million dollars. So this is what happened today in our life. We experience all these things, it's very materialistic. It's more materialistic in 1878. Uh, when Blavatsky, our teacher, found the Theosophical Society. We are so immersed in these things, but sometimes I think we, we lost track of the situation. I think one, one problem we, that people before were, were simple intellectually, but they were more devotional and less materialist. Right. So today, uh, they, if they stay with a simple attitude, but because the whole culture is more materialistic, then they just become materialistic. That's why I think now pe people need to work more on understanding, um, not to be dragged into materialism. Or whatever the culture is doing. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. I can see how we, you know, in the past, the devotion maybe was enough for a person to try to be a good person, not to be selfish, uh, but also life was simple and tough. So today it's so easy to become hedonistic and, you know. Right. Could I make a little, say a little something? Yes, yeah, absolutely. There are still mystic Christians and mystic Catholics, not just the liberal Catholic church, but the charismatics are alive and well. There's a, uh, there's a monastery called the Immaculate Heart Hermitage, which is just below Big Sur. And uh, I spent a lot of time there and they had, they're very poor. Uh, they don't do a lot of outreach into communities, but it's all, they're completely uh, um, cloistered. And the, the priests and the, the brothers there uh, don't go outside the church a whole lot. 
although Father David Stendelrast came from that group. And, uh, and then a faction of those priests and brothers will go down to uh, charismatic um, events in Los Angeles, I think it was in Los Angeles uh, regularly. So, the, and they were, they are extremely devout, the group. Uh, it's also called New Kamaldolis. Uh, probably some of you know of this group, but um, they, they're char charismatic. Not all of them, but a faction of them are. And, uh, and there's also a, one, one of my all time favorite books is called By the River Piedra, I Sat Down and Wept. Uh, it's a beautiful book about the charismatics by the, uh, the guy that wrote Alchemy, uh, Paolo Coelho. Coelho? Mm -hmm. I, I can never say Coelho. his name. Yeah, Paolo Coelho. Coelho, yeah. That's a lovely book. So I don't know. I think uh, there's, you know, there's been a lot of greed uh, in, in the fall of the Catholic Church, but um, at least of uh, Rome. But, but I think that there are many who are keeping the true essence of it alive. And, and I think that the, the cloud of unknowing also speaks to that same you know, uh, yes, we all live in the world, but go beyond the world, that that's a possibility and, and, and um, documented uh, by those who, who attempt it. Esoteric Christianity is what I'm talking about, really. Thank you. Uh, any other last comments? Um, I, I think this is a good place to call it quits for the evening. Um, because the rest of the uh, chapter just kind of goes on and talks about uh, some of the other different mystics um, from the different um, sex, factions that there are. So um, any other takeaways or uh, uh, final comments? I don't think that the two statements about mysticism that Father Elwood made at the very beginning are correct. I think I don't think a mystic would say, uh, "I am one with God," or "I am one with nature." He wouldn't say that. He'd just say, "There is oneness." The eye, when you've experienced oneness, the eye is the size of a pinhead. It, it almost doesn't exist. And the same with experiencing God. The, the individual disappears for a while, almost during those experiences. And, and say again, what, what do you think they, how do you think they would put it? Uh, I, I am oneness. There, is, there, is, there is God. <laughs> there is a God. <laughs> Be right. of God. There is a God. Or there is God. And uh, 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 there's oneness also. Yeah, just, uh, I am one with nature. Just, there is oneness. Right. All things. Thanks. He's saying there's no I at that point. Right, yeah. Right, what was it that Krishnamurti said when he had his experience? What, didn't he say, I was the blade of grass and the blade of grass was me or something yeah. like that? 